Hey, welcome back. In this video, I just want to talk about zero force members in trust systems. So it's possible that in some of these trusses that some of the individual members will actually have no internal forces depending on the configuration of the externally applied forces. Um, some of the ways, I guess before we start talking about that, I want to talk about these kind of three types of, uh, of joints we can have or joint configurations with other members. So imagine looking at this top one. Imagine if there was some internal force in this member here. There's two members connected at one joint, they're collinear, they're both in line with each other. For this joint to stay in static equilibrium, this other member has to have the equal and opposite force in it. So if it's compression on this side, it has to be compression on that side. If it was tension on this side, it would also have to be tension on this side, right? For this thing to stay in static equilibrium. Otherwise, if these were imbalanced or not equal magnitudes, uh, this thing would have, the joint would actually have the tendency to translate along one of these lines. So. Uh, the first thing that we can get, the first situation we can have with a zero force member is if there's actually zero forces inside this and there's zero external forces applied to this kind of setup we have here. Imagine there's no internal force here, but there is an internal force here. Um, if with nothing to counteract that and there's some tension here or something, then this joint would want to translate up this way. So in the case of this, in the case of these two collinear members with no external forces, um, then they have to both have zero force. If this guy has zero force, then this guy has to have zero force as well for this thing to still be in static equilibrium. Another situation that we can get a zero force member is, imagine we have this setup here where we actually have three members connecting at a joint where two of them are collinear. So imagine again, we have some amount of compressive force like this. Uh, for this thing to be in static equilibrium, we'd have to have the same compressive force resisting that. If it was tension, this side would just have to be tension as well. But if there's any amount of force in this, let's say there's, let's say this is tension. Um, there's nothing else to be able to pull on this because these guys can't support a lateral load. And so this thing would just start translating or drifting off in this direction, making it not in static equilibrium because the sum of forces in this direction would not sum to zero. So in order for the sum of forces in this particular direction to sum to zero, there actually has to be zero internal forces in this guy. So whenever you see something like that, for example, I'm seeing something like this. We have uh, we have a joint here with three members. Two of them are in line and one of them is not in line. Well, this member here has to be a zero force member because otherwise, if it was pulling or pushing, it would make this joint out of equilibrium. So that's something that we can look for too for, uh, for zero force members. Okay, the other kind of situation that we can have is imagine if we have, again, let's say we have a compressive force in this member and we have a compressive force in this member. Their X components might be balancing each other out, but no matter what, their Y components are summing up to some positive force in the Y direction. In this thing, this joint would have the tendency to translate upwards. Same thing if these guys were tensile. Um, then their net force, the net Y force would be negative and this thing would have the tendency to translate downwards. So the third case is when we have a joint with two non-collinear members, so just two members that aren't in line and no external force, then uh, they both have to be zero force members, otherwise this joint will not be in equilibrium. When we're going through analyzing four zero force members, if there is, we do it, we do it joint by joint kind of, and if there is an external force applied at at a joint, uh, for example, here I'll draw a straight line. We have some external force, you know, acting like this. At this joint, we can no longer just say by inspection that this is a zero force member. Actually, it wouldn't be because again, we would have these guys would be these guys would be doing their thing in this plane. But this force would actually be introducing a force in uh, in the plane of the two collinear guys, and also in the plane that's perpendicular to that. Uh, and so this would indeed have to have some amount of force to kind of counteract whatever that force is. And it's when you see an applied force at a joint, you can't immediately start saying that things are zero force members at that joint using these three definitions. So let's go through these two examples and pick out all of the zero force members that we can find. Um, we already mentioned this one. So we have two collinear uh, members with a third member that's not in the same plane as them or not in the same line as them. Obviously, if this had any tension or compression in it, it would be making this joint out of equilibrium. So this guy is a zero force member. Let's put a little circle around that. Um, knowing that this one is a zero force member, we 
we can look at this. And so if this is zero force, it might as well not be there. And here we have another two collinear forces uh, with a third member, uh, sorry, two collinear members with a third member that's not in the same line as them acting at this joint. Uh, and so by this definition here, this member also has to be a zero force member. Now, when we look at this joint, we actually can't say anything based on this joint because it has an applied force at it, and so we're actually not sure. We can't, you know, we know that something in the plane here that's perpendicular to these two uh, collinear members will actually have to take some of the load of this force. So we're not actually sure, but what we can do is we can come down and look at this guy. Um, it's not the joint with applied force on it, so we're good to go. We can analyze it independently. We have two members collinear, one that's not collinear, and that means that otherwise if this had any amount of force in it, it would be making this joint out of equilibrium. So this guy is also a zero force member. Now when we look at this joint, we can see that, um, that this member here will take all of the component of this blue applied force that's perpendicular to these two collinear members. Okay, is anything in here a zero force member? Well, no. When we look at this joint, this force is going, or this member is going to introduce some amount of uh, some amount of force in the the y direction, and this guy here is going to have to counteract that. So we found the three zero force members in this diagram. Um, something that we can do, just so you can wrap your head around it, is we can just show you what or I can just show you what the equivalent is. So basically, if we just erase the zero force members, like that, that and get rid of that guy, um, you could solve this problem analyzing it as if these three zero force members didn't even exist and uh, these are equivalent systems basically uh, with the current loading. Obviously if the loading changed we would have to reevaluate but these are the only members here that actually have internal forces in them. Alright, uh, let's go down here and look at uh, if we can find any zero force members in this guy. So again here we have two collinear members, a third one that's not in the same line. This guy is definitely going to be a zero force member, otherwise it would be pushing this joint up or down. Uh, once we knock that one out, we can see here that we have two collinear and the other potential guy here. Uh, again, that would be pushing out of the plane that these two are in, or out of the line that those two form, so this one is a zero force member. Actually, I think what we should do is I'll erase them as we go, and it'll be easier for us to kind of track the, the progress that we're making in this equivalent system. So I'll come in here and I'll erase the two zero force members that we found so far. Now what the next thing that we want to do is, um, let's look at this. So we have a member here, a member here, collinear, a third member here. Obviously, if there's any amount of force in here pushing it, it would translate this uh, this joint here in this direction or this direction. So this guy also is a zero force member. And we can go and erase that just like this. All right, so knowing that this one is zero force, we've erased it here. The other thing we can look at now is the the situation here, well, now we have two more collinear guys and definitely we can't have any force in this one, otherwise it would push or pull this joint. So this is also zero force member and we can come in here and erase that guy. Uh, there we go. And there's one more zero force member in here, it's kind of hard to see, but if we think about this, this reaction here can only provide a, a reaction force that's normal to the wall right, because it's on a roller. Um, so if we're providing a normal force here, and then this has zero force in it, this will have to be equal and opposite. And then looking at that, it looks like we have two collinear forces, so there actually can't be anything in here, because if there was some amount of force in here, it would make this joint fall out of equilibrium. So this guy also is zero force member, and then we can come in and erase it out of here. So there you go, this truss had five zero force members in it, this truss had three zero force members in it, and if you just want to solve this problem now, if you were given the applied, the applied force and you were asked to find all of the internal forces of all of the members, this would actually simplify your process quite a bit uh, when you're going to find those because we'd actually, we'd already know that a lot of them are zero.